Doctor Who is a fantasy science fiction adventure show that started airing in 1963, starring a time-travelling Time Lord known as the Doctor, and a various array of trusty companions that travelled around space and time in a flying, physics-busting police box called the TARDIS, in order to save the universe from endless amounts of fearsome aliens looking for world domination. You've most likely heard of this show before, with it being a huge cult success for all the time it's been around, and everyone arguing about whether or not the new Doctor being a woman is the best or worst thing in television history, but after eight different Doctors in the 20th century, the show stopped airing in 1989. And for a while, people thought that their lovable, vortex-surfing, screwdriver-wielding Superman had gone forever, but in 2005, they were all proven wrong when the show quite suddenly rebooted back onto our television screens. But how exactly would this show fare in the 21st century? And can it attract new fans into the series as well as sustain its old fans? Watch as I take a look at each episode, series by series, to give an overall impression of where I think the show stands. And just for the record, I'm not the most acquainted with the classic episodes of the show. I have seen two feature films starring Peter Cushing, as well as this Dalek four-parter with Tom Baker as the Doctor. And so, this is Doctor Who, Series 1. The Review. So after a new, exciting sequence travelling through the vortex and renewed theme song, we begin with... So this is Rose Tyler, who is played by Billy Piper. I could do A-levels. No. And she is going to become the Doctor's new companion, who is played by Christopher Eccleston. Lots of planets have a north. But of course, they're going to need an adversary to take on to kick off the reboot. And with a rich history of monsters such as the Daleks, Sontar, and Cybermen, and whatnot, what adversary do you think we're going to be taking on in our pilots? Walking mannequins with guns, a headless horror, Don't think that's gonna stop me. a pit of lava, and a Venus spin trap. <laughs> so it is a rather weird choice of foes to take on right off the bat, although I do still think this approach kind of works. It does take a creepy degree in the beginning in the store, which would be scary for the more squeamish of people. Not to mention that these dummies, known as Autumns, are classic villains from Doctor Who, which offers a bit of nostalgia for fans of the classic era. But it's not just the foes that make this a pretty good pilot. A lot of this episode, particularly in the first half, has a high sense of mystery hanging about it. What with Rose's encounter with the conspiracy theorists about just who this mysterious Doctor is, which deepens the mystery with this character for newcomers. But Christopher Eccleston really stands out as the Time Lord, capturing exactly how this character should be feeling at the given time, whether it's sarcasm towards an oblivious human, to openly dealing with alien technology in front of said human, and of course, getting himself a memorable one-liner. Fantastic. So the show ends with Rose saving the world by knocking the Ortons and the Antiplastic into the nesting consciousness. You know, if this was Doctor Who in 2017, they would have made a Tarzan reference there. Trapped in an eternal winter, like... Like Frozen. It's a movie. So the Doctor offers to take Rose with him across the galaxy, but she reluctantly turns down the offer to look after her mother and boyfriend. By the way, did I mention it also travels in time? Shut up and take my money! In the second episode, we see the Doctor and Rose go on their first proper adventure. And where do you think is the ideal first place to take a new companion who's just getting to grips with the idea of space and time travel? Five billion years into the future to witness the inevitable destruction of the Earth. Thanks, Rick Sanchez. So the two of them are in the observation deck, where special guests will get to observe the destruction of the Earth from the Sun. He's blue. We have in attendance the Doctor and Rose Tyler. Yes, representing the forest of Cheem, we have trees, namely Jabe, Newt, and Hopper. There will be an exchange of Jolko and Jolko. We have the box of Balhoon, Hop, Piney, and Cow, Spark, Mr. and Mrs. Pack. Who exactly are you talking to? Well, of course, things start going wrong when these spider bug things emerge and somehow manage to pull a fully grown person through a vent. But it turns out they were snuck on by the adherents of the repeated meme, who were conjured by Lady Cassandra, who intends to sabotage the event by exposing them to the exploding sun. And with the heat shield deactivated, it's up to the Doctor to reactivate it by completing what looks very similar to a video game sequence. And after he saves the day once again, 
we learn a shocking revelation in the Doctor Who canon. My planet's gone. It's dead. There was a war and we lost. The last of the Time Lords. They're all gone. Now this would be pretty hard hitting to fans of the classic era. For one, the Doctor is now the only one of the Time Lords that now exists. All of the other Time Lord friends and companions from before are all gone. Which is used to make the audience feel more empathetic towards the Doctor, as well as put him in a completely new scenario from the classic show, while still keeping the old formula of travel to this place, save it from the nemesis. The rest of the episode is pretty fine. It takes the opportunity for the BBC to show off their costumes, makeup and puppet designs, and some simple CGI characters, but the newly introduced characters themselves barely seem to have that much character to them in all honesty. Well, I mean, he's going to be important later. This cleaner was alright. And Lady Cassandra is really well portrayed by Zoe Wanamaker. And the writers do create a rather interesting threat that isn't quite as ridiculous as Killer Mannequins. <laughs> Overall, this episode focuses on the adventure that could come from Doctor Who, with all the varieties of odd faces that we see in this episode. The Unquiet Dead follows, and is our first episode of the series set in the past in the time of Charles Dickens in 1869. But at one of his readings of A Christmas Carol, there seems to be an unlikely guest in the audience. And it turns out this gas form of life is in search of bodies in order to keep itself alive. And for the most part, this episode plays out with a much calmer change of pace, where there's an alien life form that's in danger and needs help from the Doctor, instead of posing a threat to the world. That is until it turns out this is an endangered race that's got other plans and wants to embody the whole living human race. Until Dickens saves the Doctor and Rose, and indeed the world, by working out that the beings are entrapped by gas. But one of my favourite things about this episode is the interpretation that Dickens would supposedly go on to write about these ghosts in his next novel. The mystery of Edwin Drood still lacks an ending. Perhaps the killer was not of this earth. The mystery of Edwin Drood and the Blue Elementals. But this just so happens to be the novel where Dickens died before he could get to finish it, meaning he'd never get a chance to reference the ghosts at all. And the portrayal of Dickens by Simon Callow is just truly wonderful to watch on screen. So Dickens got handled more or less perfectly in this episode. The story, like I said for the most part, takes a much calmer pace than we've seen so far before. Which can be quite risky, but interesting characters played well, and a mysterious scenario keep the audience intrigued to the story. And this brings us to the first two parts of the series, where the Doctor and Rose return to her home in London after just... 12 hours. So Rose can now happily reunite with her mother, and not have to tell anyone about the time and space travel that she's been getting up to... It's not 12 hours, it's uh, 12 months. What? You've been gone a whole year. <sighs> Sorry. Lich. I mean, you're a time traveller. How could this have happened? Did you literally just go on those two adventures and somehow completely miscalculate your return creating a fixed point where Rose has been missing a whole year? When you say 900 years... That's my age. You're 900 years old. Yeah. Wow. Eat your heart out, Yoda. But it's not long before trouble ensues when a spaceship suddenly appears from down below and crashes into an apparently backwards Big Ben before landing into the Thames. And tension is made higher with the Prime Minister apparently being missing. Well, we all know who that is. But this stand-in MP for Prime Minister has already been snatched by our alien who has a very distinct giveaway sound. Oh, hold on. Our first new proper alien gives itself away by farting. Fantastic. <laughs> oh. Excuse me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Look, I know this show's supposed to be marketed to children as well as adults, but this is just- I'm shaking my booty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really hope this is a satire now because this- Oh boy. And after Rose's mum Jackie and her boyfriend Mickey find out about the TARDIS, Jackie calls the government telling them about this, and the Doctor and Rose soon get escorted to Downing Street, but are led into a trap as the creatures known as the Slovene reveal their true identity. We are the Slovene. And this is a great cliffhanger to leave the episode on, 
with pretty much all the main characters under very high threat, essentially taking the series into a much darker tone, with these seven eight-foot aliens killing people to disguise themselves inside their empty bodies. Its scariness almost compensates for the farting. Oh. <laughs> but just as the Doctor saves himself, the Slovene go and blame him for the deaths of the unit soldiers and order him to be executed. But he escapes thanks to... convenience. And lo and behold, undoubtedly the most ridiculous lines in all of Doctor Who. I need to be naked. Rejoice in it. Your body is magnificent. So the Doctor, Rose and Harriet Jones get away by sealing themselves inside the bunker room that Downing Street apparently has, before calling Mickey, who saved Jackie earlier, for help. It says password. Buffalo 2x1L. Were passwords seriously that weak ten years ago? Password again. Just repeat it every time. And when they find out the origins of the Slovene, they learn their main weakness. <laughs> Vinegar. <laughs> But the rest of the Slovene have a plan to acquire the UN nuclear codes that will be used to destroy the entire planet to be sold off for profit. Victory should be naked! But thanks to the help of Mickey, a missile is launched destroying Number 10 and the Slovene with the trio tucked away in a safe compartment. And the great thing about this episode is, even though the Slovene do look pretty ridiculous, this episode had me excited. As somebody who hasn't watched this far back properly yet, with the constant threat that the adversaries pose to our main characters, and indeed the world, and apart from some overly convenient scenarios, a rather unpredictable story, which is all enough to engage a young and old audience at this point, whilst also making good use of our secondary characters. Harriet Jones is likeable, and the people who are close to Rose put on a good performance showing that their main characters are starting to develop. People like to turn a blind eye to this two-parter, mainly due to the farting aliens, but it has arguably the most action and excitement we've seen so far, keeping the show moving along at a really healthy pace. We next see the Doctor and Rose only a few years in the future now, in a secret alien museum in Utah, and after a friendly nod to Classic Who, they get taken to the collector of these items, Henry Van Staten. We arrested two intruders 53 floors down. We don't know how they got in. I'll tell you how they got in. Intruder window. <laughs> and so he introduces the Doctor to the only living specimen in his possession. The last Dalek. And this scene is brilliant. The Doctor lets out so much emotion, so much passion, more than we've seen in the series thus far on only this one Dalek, revealing more implications on what truly happened in this time war that we've vaguely heard about, and his hatred to this truly feared, vintage Doctor Who adversary. But it's also quite strange seeing this age-old enemy in such a vulnerable state, especially considering how much chaos they've caused multiple times in the past, and then being imprisoned in a very inhumane way by humans. Anyway, Rose encounters this Dalek, and feeling sympathy for it, decides to touch it, which somehow regenerates all its potential power. What you gonna do? Suck me to death. So that's what those things do. And this Dalek, now on the loose, starts to wreak havoc. He's the one. But it soon must come across its lifelong weakness. Stairs. Kill yourself. But soon after, this Dalek finds it can no longer exterminate people, since the DNA it had absorbed from Rose earlier has caused it to feel multiple emotions, which is so painful that it decides death is the only option. This episode is really powerful. Not only does it explore the chaos that could be caused by just one Dalek, which feels like a nod to a film with a similar title and concept, but plays on its idea of emotions, and how a Dalek cannot exist outside the world of being a killer. As well as seeing it and the Doctor almost swap roles, with the Doctor hell-bent on destroying it, 
even when it finally starts to feel compassion. Seeing the Dalek now in this state is truly engaging to the audience and a brilliant refresher from the classic series, who will have known these terrifying creatures since they're showing as the very first alien adversary in Doctor Who. So we next see the Doctor and Rose travel to the year 200,000 to Satellite 5 with that British geezer from last episode, cause why not? And on this satellite orbiting the Earth, they are told about Floor 500, a sort of utopia-esque floor where the walls are made of gold. But of course, this turns out to be a lie when we see that the entire station and humanity on board is all run by... Yeah, this thing. Meanwhile, Adam gets a special chip implanted into him, which he uses to extract the history of the human race up until that point, in order to predict the future accurately back in his time. So the Doctor defeats the Jagra thing, I call him Max. gets humanity back on track, and kicks Adam out of the TARDIS for attempting to collapse all of history. One second of that message could have changed the world. The purpose of the title, The Long Game, is likely implemented to foreshadow the 100 years of collective game shows that spawn as a result of the actions taken in this episode. But... Long story short, this episode just really isn't as exciting as what we've seen so far. Not in the way that some episodes take a calmer approach, but tries to build up a mystery to a climax which actually comes out quite underwhelming, making this episode pretty forgettable. Although good old Simon Pegg does do some good credit as the editor, but he's the only even remotely memorable new character here. This next episode is a pretty emotional ride. It involves Rose going back to the day that her father, Peter Tyler, died. Which, when you think about it, isn't really the best idea since, in a worst case scenario... Rose! No! Saves your life! She the speed She bends the entire fabric of time by saving her father when he should have died. And of course, this action goes without being unpunished, but not before... Doctor Who... Rick rolls us. Right, bye. Right. So really, you're a, a bit of a Dow boy. So anyway, this is basically what happens when you mess around with time. <laughs> and with time and space decaying around them, and the Doctor himself eventually getting consumed by a Reaper, Peter is quick to learn what has happened, and he proceeds to end his own life the way it should have ended in this loop in time which restores time and the universe. This could arguably be the most impactful episode of the whole series. It teaches the viewers a lesson on time, and how it's not something that can simply be tampered with to your will. Otherwise a paradox could get created, and time itself stops making sense, which even a Time Lord cannot deal with, as symbolised when the Doctor himself fails to save everyone and is eaten by the Reapers. Thus it's left to the ones who caused the fracture to deal with the mess themselves. In turn, removing the Reapers, restoring time and space, and the Doctor himself. So this next episode takes us back to the past in the middle of the London Blitz. Now here's a name we'll come to remember. And whilst they're there, the Doctor receives a very odd phone call on his TARDIS. Hello? This is the Doctor speaking. I'm not a elf. And when Rose gets herself in danger, she gets rescued by a completely new time traveller, Jack Harkness. Captain. Noted. He's a time agent, an all-round charmer from the 51st century, parked up next to Big Ben, that's no longer mirrored, but here at the Blitz, we have a bunch of gas mask zombies trying to find their mummy. What happens if they touch us? You're looking at it. And a lot of people tend to think of this two-parter when they think of what episodes of Doctor Who gave them nightmares when they were younger, or which episodes at least got them really scared. The horror and dramatic tension is built up marvellously from when we first encountered the gas mask child, from standing ominously on that building, to taking over all electrical devices in Nancy's house, just to try and get itself heard in a terrifying way, with its heart-stopping one-liner. Are you my mummy? all the way to the cliffhanger climax of this episode, when it appears that this virus has spread to other characters, and watching their human face transform into this terrifying empty creature is just frightening and absolutely brilliant. In part two of the story, we learn that they all came from something that Jack planted near the hospital that's turning everyone it touches into these awful zombies. But it turns out that Nancy was secretly the single young mother of this child all along, which would have been an extremely controversial position to be in in those days. 
and whose child got hit by the capsule that the doctor was chasing at the start, which released the antibodies to systematically heal the human race to become exactly what the child that it hit when crash landing to Earth, which is cured when Nancy finally faces up to her fears and literally embraces her child, which actually ends the virus and restores everyone affected into pristine condition, including the boy himself. For a two-parter that frightened so many, this is a really heartwarming ending to a terrific first entry from Stephen Moffat. The concept of the healing nanoparticles getting confused and patching up humanity in the image and state of the boy they found is really interesting and very well told on Moffat's behalf. And Captain Jack's flamboyancy is a truly brilliant addition to the series that adds a tone I actually think the show could do with. His character bounces off the Doctor and Rose brilliantly and represents a really subtle subtext about American and British war brides at the time. But overall, this is much deservedly one of the highlights of the first series of Doctor Who. Good job, Muffet. Have a jammy dodger. So the next episode, Boomtown, is set six months after the Slovene two-parter, when it turns out that one of them survived by conveniently teleporting out, and she plans to build a nuclear power station in Cardiff over the interdimensional rift from the Unquiet Dead and have it go wrong to avenge the rest of the Slovene and destroy the planet. But she suddenly starts to feel emotions when talking about a colleague who has a future and a family. This afterwards leads to the Doctor and Co catching her and preparing her for a journey back to her home world, Raxacoic of Alipatorius, where she's scheduled to be executed. But when the rift opens up anyway, the Doctor is able to stop this and transform her into a Slovene egg as a means of giving her a second chance at life. Similarly to The Unquiet Dead, this episode takes a much quieter tone from the rest of the series and is used to examine the bonds between the characters present, including the state of the relationship that Rose and Mickey had, as well as the Doctor and the Slovene who he's supposedly taking to their execution. But on the whole, it doesn't really feel like this episode goes anywhere. It shows some good development in Margaret Slovene, which is nice, but doesn't really end up going anywhere with it. She just turns out to be evil again, and therefore put inside an egg. Essentially to restart her life as a completely different character. The only things that have established this episode, essentially stopping it from being pure filler, is that Rose and Mickey's relationship isn't going to work out anymore. And at the heart of the TARDIS can be opened up, which will be very important later. And so we arrive at our two-parter finale, set back on Satellite 5 100 years after we last encountered it when a doctor suddenly appears on future Big Brother. Nice bit of foreshadowing there. And it turns out this satellite is now full of future TV shows, with Rose appearing on... Welcome to the Wicker Thing. The Android. You get it? Because it's Anne Robinson and she's a robot. And if you get voted out, then she kills you with an android mouth laser live on TV, and the winner gets to escape with their life. Bitch, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. And the doctor is now on Big Brother, which also kills you, and he totally rebels the system. Okay, how could a finale for a show that's been dead for 20 years get any crazier than this? Elaine the Pain runs this station. And as danger rises, the Doctor and Jack and Linda with a wife and big brother proceed to make their escape and quickly make their way to rescue Rose, but only to get there too late. But after a jailbreak, they manage to infiltrate 4500 and learn a shocking truth. But it turns out that the now great big Emperor Dalek has created a brand new army of Daleks out of the humans of whom had lost the games in Game Station and are now preparing to attack the station and the Earth itself. So the Doctor, having just come out of fearing that Rose had been dead and plans to beat the Daleks by irradiating everything around him, sends her back home in order to keep her safe. And as the Daleks attack the station, the Doctor and crew hold up whatever defenses they can, from guns to barricades to Anne Robinson. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. You are the weakest link. It wasn't very effective. And as the Daleks wreak havoc and everybody on board gets exterminated, 
Rose convinces Jackie and Mickey to help her get back to the Doctor by opening up the heart of the TARDIS and using the power of the Time Vortex to destroy all the Daleks herself and even revive Captain Jack Harkness from the dead. But since this injection is lethal, the Doctor does the heroic thing and absorbs it out of her, which in turn ends up doing lethal damage to himself and thus causing him to regenerate into that creepy guy we briefly see from Harry Potter. Hello, father. And that just about wraps up the finale. And what a finale it was. It has constant excitement and suspense and genuine threat from a very sudden army of thousands of Daleks. Particularly in the moments we're told that the Earth is being invaded, exterminating all the people on the satellite, including some of our friends. This series had a reoccurring arc to it, where the message Bad Wolf kept cropping up from time to time, which would have had the audience pondering what this could have meant. And in the end, it's essentially Rose becoming a super powerful superhuman killing all the Daleks and saving the Doctor's life. This is a good climax, especially for a show reboot, and remains to this day an iconic callback when looking back on this show. But the series as a whole... Well... What better way to bring back Doctor Who? Our main characters are generally fleshed out well and are likeable. Rose is a pretty fine companion. I don't dislike her as much as a few people did. She does make a pretty good relatable character for the audience as an average Joe looking for meaning and adventure in life and didn't tend to get herself into sticky situations as much as I remembered. Even if there's a whole episode dedicated to her screwing up time. As for Eccleston's interpretation of the Doctor, what better way to describe it? He gave this role great charisma good humour and is probably one of the most underrated Doctors out there. The series does a wonderful job of exploring his character arc and including some powerful reactions to some of the situations he's in. Especially this shot where he's realised that his mortal enemy, his whole planet and race got destroyed for, are all alive and kicking and more deadly than ever in his words. Just desolated of nearly all hope. Most of the alien adversaries are handled pretty well bringing in a good blend of old and new faces to the table, although some of them are pretty silly, and some of which you probably won't even remember. And yeah, the CGI is pretty bad at some points, which is understandable given the technology available at the time, and whether or not people thought this show would be able to be a success again or not, meaning they'd have a considerably smaller budget. And did I mention that this show used to scare kids back in the day? Kids that watched and enjoyed Classic Who did get scared by many parts of the show, and the kids who watch it now will get scared once again, yet still want to come back for more. To add to that, some pretty good writing helped make this show highly enjoyable and set it up to be a serious name for early evening television. In conclusion, this is a cheesy, swashbuckling rollercoaster adventure aimed for kids and grown-ups alike. Showrunner Russell T. Davis wanted to add heart to the show whereby it lacked in the original and does a solid job in doing so. It's not going to be for everybody, but if this is the kind of thing you're into, you're going to be in for a great ride. Most definitely worth a watch. So, will David Tennant be as strong as a doctor as Christopher Eccleston? We shall find out when we take on Series 2. Catch you then. Here is one fuck. It is my gift to you. Oh, yes. 